What up, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Jesse Warden. Today, we're going to talk about what if you don't know how to do something? What do you do? Yo, bro, can I, like, pay you to figure it out for me? Programming, gaming, fitness, Jesse Warden. Right? That's the biggest problem is that when you're a brand new coder, you don't know how to do something. Or is it? I've been doing this, like, 15 years, and I still have every day a challenge where I don't know how to do this. What do I do, right? Well, I do the same three things I do now that I did 15 years ago. I'm gonna tell you what the three things are and we're gonna go over, if you don't know how to do something, what do you do to figure it out so you know how to do it? It's assumed that if you learn coding, that somehow every problem gets easier to solve and you immediately know what to do. And that's not true at all. You may have the tools in which to build things. You may have the experience to draw from to solve common problems, but everything is new usually in some small way. And if you do the same type of work over and over. So how do you figure that out? How do you solve it? If I don't know how to do something, whether I'm new or experienced, what do I do? Well, there's three things you do. The first is you teach it or summarize it, whether it's through blogging or speaking or user events, conferences, things like that. The second is you get your hands dirty and you try to figure it out, right? You just take your experience, know-how and code and libraries and put it in a mess and put it in the lab table and try to figure it out. The third is to Google it, right? So the first two require some Googling, but the third is just hardcore research. Lots and lots of Googling, lots of reading, searching for new search terms, things like that. To give an example, go to my blog, Jesse Warden, and there is an article here on streams. When I started about eight months ago, a year ago, I had no idea which streams were. I had heard about them, but I didn't know if they were JavaScript specific. I didn't know if they were in a specific language or they were a library. I didn't understand. I also knew a little bit about promises, but I didn't know how they related to streams. And a lot of smart people are acting like these are the greatest things ever. They're going to solve all your problems. And I'm like, okay, perhaps I'm missing out on something magical. Let me keep an open mind. I've been doing this a long time and it's very important not to get complacent and keep an open mind. So cool. Let's try it. I didn't know anything about it. So I had to write about it. So I created this ex, you know, insanely long blog post with code examples from a variety of libraries, right? To figure out what streams were, right? And what context they were, cold versus hot. What does that even mean, right? In the context of streams or not, what are the pros, what are the cons, right? So being able to write this long article and, and getting the research involved in it forced me to learn it. I didn't know when I started what this is. The funny thing is it's been about I don't know, three, four months since I've written this article, I actually disagree with a lot of the things I wrote in here. I've learned a lot more since then, and I would probably completely write this article a lot differently and a lot shorter with a lot of different terms and focused on a lot less specific libraries, right? But I didn't know that, and that's okay. This is the first step to get me a, a really good deep dive understanding. So if you're going to blog something or create a presentation to speak about it, it's going to require you to do a lot of research to summarize it. If you can't summarize something in less than two pages, you don't know. So if somebody says, how does this work? And it takes you two pages to explain it. You probably don't know it well enough. If you can summarize something in a tweet, if you can succinctly give a definition in less than 140 characters in two sentences or less, then you probably know something extremely well, right? You're very intimate with the details. So that's why it's important to be able to teach it. If you can teach it, it forces you to learn it and then learn it again. If you don't know how to do something, teaching it is the most effective way, I believe, to actually learn something. To give you another example, you can also speak about it. There is a group in town called RVAJS. I actually spoke about pragmatic use cases, use cases for using streams. Originally, it was supposed to be about RxJS, right? But uh, I found Bacon and Dart and a lot of other different libraries about how they deal with streams. And I learned so much and I played with code and I cr ended up creating this huge gist. So if you go to GitHub, you can create a, an account on Bitbucket or you know GitHub, it doesn't matter. The point is they have this gist thing. It allows you to paste in code, have it nicely formatted and you can share it with friends. It gives you a link. It also shows you revision. So this streams in JavaScript has a big old list, right? Of all the revisions I've done and I can format it with Markdown, which is kind of like HTML. It gives you bold and like links and pretty colors for your code. So all this code, you know, I got to play with and figure out like what would a pragmatic use case in some of my projects that I work on professionally, right? Not just from the side, but like real work, things that I get paid for. These kind of things forcing myself to be able to like have 45 minutes to convince a small, like we're talking 20 to 30 people. This isn't like a big conference. This is like 20, 30 people who are right there in front of you. I get to speak to them and convince them like, look, these are things that I feel like this code has helped me with, right? And problems that it helps me solve. Here's why you should care. And in 45 minutes, that's that's all I get to pitch them. Being able to selectively find that content and put it in a presentation 
that I believe they would find valuable, right? I don't want to waste their time. Then, you know, that means I must really know something. So doing that presentation, doing that blog post really helped me learn something and teach him. And the third thing about that is that I actually still don't know things. There's a, somebody on my YouTube to, was asking me to do JSPM IO. It's a package management solution. All I know is that it somehow works with GitHub and NPM and it works on top of system.loader. It's like the common JS slash AMD thing together that ECMAScript 6 uses and Angular uses to load either synchronous or asynchronous libraries together because you're not using import, I guess. Like that's all I know, right? Could be wrong. And that is the sum of all my knowledge as of right now. But I wanted to learn it, and I know the best way to learn things is to teach it. So it turns out there is a lightning talk. If you go to the R RVJS, it's a Richmond user group, and there's a lightning talk that they are doing where basically they have a bunch of people give five to ten minute talks. They're called lightning talks. They're really short, you know, one after the other of a topic, and you get a, a very uh, small amount of time to talk about it. They said, hey, if you want to talk about something, leave your name in the comments and a topic you'd like to talk about. You get five to 10 minutes. So I was like, cool. My name is Jesse Warden and I want to talk about JSPM.io. I don't know anything about it, but by the time our August arrives and I have five to 10 minutes to give an elevator pitch about why it's valuable and why I think it's cool, I think I'll know a little bit about it. Number two, how do you do something if you don't know how to do it, but you have some experience, you have some code knowledge, you have some libraries you found online, what do you do? Well, that comes up to getting our hands dirty. So whether you're drinking coffee or you're drinking alcohol, it doesn't matter. You got to get your hands dirty. You got to code. You got to do what it is we programmers do, and that is code. For JavaScript, you have some nice tools nowadays you can actually do online. So if you don't want to set up a grunt or a gulp build or use Yeoman and configure it with permissions and blah, 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 you can code in a browser. And you don't need this console.log thing either. You don't need to load files. You can actually code in the browser. JS Fiddle is one of them, jsfiddle.net. They allow you to create a bunch of those gist type things, but they're actual projects that work. They're HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that output to the page. So for example, this hot and cold stream buffer, I can code some JavaScript here. I can have a little HTML and see the output here. You can also see the output of your JavaScript here in the console, right? Obviously. But the point is I have this little itty bitty helper function that pukes out whatever I send to it into this HTML tag, right? So instead of using console log, it uses both, but it'll print whatever it is. So I can play with RxJS. It's not just raw JavaScript, it's anything. So I've loaded in this RxJS as an external library. They actually put on a CDN. Cool, so I load it in here. I can load any kind of libraries. They have a bunch, if you look in these uh, frameworks and extensions, they have all kinds of libraries in here. Dojo and jQuery and everything you can think of. Some of the things I've never even seen before. They'll load it for you. So when you type in your code and hit run, it'll run and print out your code. There's another one called CodePin. And again, you can save these, you can fork them, right? And so you can, this is where you play. This is where you experiment. This is your lab. And whether you're using good food or bad carbs, that's how you get her done, right? That's how you figure it out. CodePen's another one. CodePen, in like GitHub, you can actually search for code. In this case, you can search for examples that people have done on CodePen, right? A lot of them are very beautiful. So you create a new one. It's very similar to JS Fiddle. I don't need CSS because I'm a coder. Let's go to one I've actually done. I can actually go to my settings. Uh, here we go. So I spent probably, I would say, two or three hours just to get these 10 lines of code right here, trying to merge streams. I didn't know exactly how to merge a series of streams to get an output of a data stream that I wanted in a single stream or a single chunk of uh, a single array of data from like four different HTTP calls and then being able to configure that array into an object that's usable. I didn't know how to do that. It took me four, about four hours to play just to get these 10 lines of code. Sometimes it takes 30 seconds. It just depends on the challenge, if you've slept, right? If you, if you don't have kids, you're single, and you have a little different time in the world, right? those kind of things, you gotta get your hands dirty. And CodePen, JS Fiddle, Sublime, using Gulp on your desktop, whatever it is, that's another great way to learn it. Sometimes you just gotta do the elbow grease, figure things out, try, try again. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Number three, Google it. So new tab in Chrome defaults to Google. Google is the third way to learn something. If you don't know how to do something, you search that implies that you know what to search for. And that's why a lot of people get really angry and you say, let me Google that for you. Because that they already know exactly the keywords to Google for. Sometimes you don't even know. So let me give an example. Let's say I said pathfinding. Do you even know what pathfinding is? Okay, let's talk about pathfinding. Now you'll notice that Google is already giving me some suggestions. Part of that is Google. 
The other part of it is that this little thing right here is me logged in. It knows who I am and has good metadata to recognize what I often search for. Chrome actually learns, not just Google, but Chrome learns what you often search for in your behavior and your keyboard strokes, right? If I type in the word F, it automatically auto-completes Facebook, right? So if I type in pathfinding, it generally knows what to look for. But let's just let's just type in pathfinding. Just default and see what it comes up with. <clears throat> now it'll give you the definition from Wikipedia. What I like to do is take the middle mouse button on my mouse and I just click every single link on the first page. Sometimes I do the first four if I'm in a hurry. Because a lot of times you're not going to read all these. You're just going to scan to see if something's there, right? Part of research is knowing you know, how to skim and scan. They teach you that in school, the difference between skimming and scanning. I don't remember. What I do know is that it's faster than reading, right? You can verify if it's worth spending your time on. So Wikipedia is usually generally pretty good. They talk about districts out there as an A star. You say, all right, well, what is this A star thing? So then you re go back to Google. You need to type it here. Go back to Google and you research using better search terms. So sometimes you're searching to find search terms in which to search with to find the content you're looking for, right? And that's a key concept that people seem to forget is a skill. You actually get good at research. You get good at searching. You get good at manipulating and filtering through the results in Google to find what you're looking for, specifically for programming stuff. Now that we know what an A star is, let's go A star algorithm. All right, let's click the first two to see what happens. And holy cow, this guy has like a book on game A star stuff. And he's got like this outline. Let's go home. Look at this. Holy cow, this guy's got a whole site devoted to it. And he's got an outline I think I found by accident earlier. An example. And then you read this, you find more things. Oh, wait, hexagonal grid A star. That's what I want. I want a game where you can attack on like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six sides rather than four, which is a traditional tile-based system, if I'm using a fighting game, for example, or an RPG where you do pathfinding, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. How do I code that myself? Uh, maybe there's like a library or something. I don't know, A-star JavaScript, perhaps? <gasps> Looky there. How about A-star... How about uh, pathfinding JavaScript, maybe? Pathfinding JavaScript, what do you know? There's a library right there. Oh, and look, I can say start. It's an interactive tool. It's in the browser. What if I make a wall? Can you go around it? That's amazing. This code is free. It's on GitHub. You can play with it. This is my point. If you don't know how to do something, search. You see all these tabs I have open, right? I'm going to read each one of those. Sometimes better find search results. Part of not knowing how to do something is figuring it out to simply reading, research. You don't have to read everything. Just skim it. Find the, the good summary that's relevant to you. The three things that you need to do if you don't know how to do something, whether you're you know a brand new coder or you're experienced and awesome, you're still gonna have problems. You don't know how to solve them. You don't know what to do. And you gotta remember the same three techniques. And that is number one, teach it. It's the best way to learn anything, whether you're speaking, writing blog posts, going to a conference, whatever it is. Maybe you're making a library and posting to GitHub, right? You're doing a library to solve or abstract a problem. That's another way. Going to just using the social networking tools around code to interact with your peers and people and your colleagues. You don't have to meet them in person. We're all distributed workforce. That's what social media is for. Number two is simply getting your hands dirty, coding, figuring it out, playing with different libraries, seeing what happens, just being interactive, coding playing the lab. Number three, using Google. Research. Read. Search for more refined search terms. Keep going. That's the kind of skim and scan the research. You don't have to spend all day Googling your heart's content. That's how you do it. And hopefully that helps you. Don't know how to do something. You've been doing coding for a while and you still keep having problems you don't know how to do. It's normal. That's what we do is we solve problems. Sometimes we have bugs and we solve those bugs by searching in those same three ways. But if you're tackling a new problem, that those are sometimes some of the most fun problems next to debugging is that I don't know how to do something. I get to solve this. I get to problem solve through research, experimentation, and teaching, teaching others, teaching my client, teaching the user. So again, my name is Jesse Ward. You got any other questions, hit me up in YouTube, YouTube comments. I didn't respond there. Facebook, Google+, Twitter, whatever, email. And I hope it helps you all out.